All right, you're in math. You're in Malachi chapter four. The Bible reads, "For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts." that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the book of Malachi. Thank you for the Bible itself and for this church that is unafraid of preaching from Genesis to Revelation, the whole counsel of God. I pray that we all pay very close attention to what Brother Adam Fannin has for us, and I also pray that you fill him with your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 All right. Dear Malachi chapter 4, verse number 1, look, it says, For behold, the day cometh, that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that I shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 5, keeping your finger here in Malachi 4. We've got a lot of scripture to cover. There's only a few verses here, but there's a lot of references we're going to look at tonight. And we're going to get through it as quickly as possible. But I want you to keep a hand or a finger or a bulletin or something in Malachi chapter 4 for the duration of the evening. Now, here he's talking about how the Lord in the day of the Lord will destroy, He will burn up the wicked, the proud. Right? And our world is filled with a bunch of prideful, wicked God-haters. And one day God's going to come back and He's going to take care of them. God will avenge. And sometimes we look and we say, well, Lord, when are you going to take care of them? Because, man, it's getting crazy. Man, they're getting weirder and weirder. And it's, it's not for us to take up arms. It's not for us to rise and try to avenge ourselves or even avenge the Lord. That is something that the Lord Himself will do. And there are many things that Jesus said to the generation that He walked amongst and He told, you know, hey, He's going to come back and get them. They will be judged one day, even though they passed away. They went to the grave, right? Many of them went to hell. And yet there's still revenge coming. There's still judgment coming. There's still things that are going to happen. And Jesus wants us to have our trust in Him in all aspects of life, including not avenging ourselves. Right? The Lord will avenge. In Isaiah 2 of the day of the Lord, He says, For the day of the... Stay in Isaiah 5. But in 2 He says, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. So just as much in Malachi 4, it talks about the wicked and the proud. He says the same thing in Isaiah 13. He says, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Right? Not from us. It comes from God. The destruction, the revenge, comes from the Almighty. He says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Now, that's not talking about, you know, we are saved sinners. Let's be real. We're all still sinners in here. Right, right. But the world mocks. Oh, well, you mo they mock sin, right. right? The fool in his heart, he mocks sin, and they mock God and his word. And, you know, those that love sin and ultimately reject God, that's who he's talking about here. Because it's not saying everybody that ever sins because, hey, I sin, but yet I fear the Lord. Yeah. I sin, but yet I trust the Lord for salvation because I'm, I'm humble enough to recognize I cannot save myself. Right. It can only come from a righteous God. Like I said, fools make a mock of sin. But you know, as Christians, as born-again believers, we should confess it. We should deal with it. We should deal, deal with it every day. You know, we should keep a short account with God. It shouldn't be something where you feel like you go all week and then you get caught up. 
it should be something when you do it, get it right. When you do it, get it right. That's right. And the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, if you keep coming back, Lord, I did it again, He's going to say, it's okay. You do it, it's okay. Lord, I'm sorry, I did it again. It's okay. He'll continue to forgive us so long as we come with the right heart, a humble and contrite heart. Amen. Hey, I want to get it right and I keep messing up. The Lord honors that because yeah, that's the goal as Christians. It's not to... It, it, I mean, we will never be perfect in right. this world, but we strive for perfection in serving the Lord and keeping His law. You know, in Isaiah 5, where you're at, look at verse number 20. He says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Right? There's, there's Obama, there's Trump, there's Clinton, all of them fall in this category. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. These people he's talking about, they want you to think what God calls evil is a good thing and what God calls good is a bad thing. It's an evil thing. And that's the world we live in. That is the justice system of today. Notice it talks about the bribing of judges. It says, which justify the wicked for reward. I mean, it's hard to find an honest judge in America that doesn't have a secret handshake, that doesn't have a bribe or a payoff or some sort of a compromise to where you can get them to rule however you want. And unfortunately, this is the world that we live in. And I think sometimes God allows us to suffer defeat at the hands of the world just so we say, well, you know what? One day, there'll be a just king. One day, there'll be a righteous judge on the earth. And we need to recognize it. And that way, we can be a witness against the world and understand how wicked and evil this system is. And look what he says here in, the, in verse 23. He says, the tail end of it, he says, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. And this reminds me of Romans 1, the tail end of that, where it's talking about they want to take somebody's righteousness from them. They see somebody that's pure and innocent and are undefiled, and they want to try to find a way to cause them to join, to follow them in their foolishness and in their sin. Right. And this is why we need to preach the Word of God. This is why we need to warn people about the judgment of God, because people are out there trying to take advantage of the naive. And it's our responsibility to stand up and warn others. Look at verse 24. He says, And what's God going to do about it? Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Keeping your finger in Isaiah 5, flip back to Malachi 1. I want you at Malachi 4. I want you to look at verse 1 again. So here he just said, he talked about the fire devouring them. He says their root will be as rottenness. In Malachi 4.1 it says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wicked, wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now turn back to Isaiah 5. So again, the Lord is saying, hey, you see they're evil, but don't worry, I'll get them. You know, we stand against it, but we don't fight them. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, right? This is spiritual warfare we're in. So we're going to look at the spiritual application in this chapter. Look at verse number 11. Again, the people that are against the Lord, he says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial, the tabret and the pipe, and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. A drunkard cannot have the desire to do the Lord's work. Yeah. Right? When you're being led by the spirit of spirits, right, of wine, of strong drink, you cannot work for the Lord. That's right. You are given over to a different mind. You're given over to the desires of the flesh. Right. And the Lord here, and yet again, we saw it earlier in this same chapter, He's warning against drunkenness. And God loves sobriety. There's no reason you should be drunk. Amen. Whether it's marijuana or pills or wine that is alcoholic, right? No matter what it is, you should not be somebody that's given over to losing your sobriety. 
Amen. Look, he says in verse 13, Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Doesn't this sound familiar to my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge? Yeah. Right? My people are in bondage, right? They go into captivity because of a lack of knowledge. Right. That's why this month, next month rather, next year, we're going to read the entire New Testament in one month. Amen. Why? To get it in our heart. Right. To right. get it in our mind. To meditate on it. And I promise you, the Word of God will not return void. I promise you that if you say, I'm going to get up an hour early, I'm going to do this. When you go out into the world and you find problems, when you have temptations, when you have trials, you will be walking in the Spirit already because you've started the day. You said, you know what? My flesh can suffer a little. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to get in the Word of God. I'm going to get in the Spirit now and I'm going to start my day off right. That's I good. promise you if you start out your day like that, it will change things. It will help you to be more successful as a Christian. It will give you a stronger spirit. Look what he says here. And the rest of the verses, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished. And their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down. And the mighty man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Now turn back to Malachi 4. In Isaiah 5 here, he's given us a description of what's going to happen in the day of the Lord. How it is that God will be exalted when He judges righteously, and He takes all these proud, puffed up people in the world that mock God and Christianity and the Bible and sin, and God's going to bring them down low. They will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, sir. So our rejoicing in victory will be when God is magnified in judgment. The wicked punishment. So we will suffer now sometimes. In this life, we're going to have problems and trials. We're going to see God mocked. Right? The kingdom of heaven will suffer violence. But that's okay. God will come and judge. And He talks about this in the day of the Lord. Look at verse Verse number 2, he says, But unto you that fear my name, that's us, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in His wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now this is talking about the resurrection. First, when he mentions fear my name, right? Those are saved people that have called on the name of the Lord, that fear God's law, right? He says, the Son of Righteousness. It's a very unique phrase because it actually says S-U-N. Right? The sun that we see in the sky. That We don't worship the sun, but in a sense, that is a picture how God is light. Right? In Him is light. And light is good and darkness is evil. In the same way, He's called the, di the day star that should arise in your hearts. Right? In Revelation, he's, Jesus is called the bright and morning star. Yeah. What is the biggest star that you see every morning? The sun, right? So the sun of righteousness is a spiritual picture. Here's, here's something in the flesh that's physical that we look at that says this is just, just a picture of how important God is. How righteousness comes from God. Now, look at the end of it here. It says, healing in His wings. He talks about, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. This is talking about the resurrection of the saints. This is talking about when believers, they... They come forth, they will, it says, they go forth and grow up. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In Job 19, it says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. There's coming a point where Job said, Hey, I know this body's going to pass away. But yet my spirit, my soul, I will see God. Job knew it. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. The resurrection of the saints, the resurrection, the, the being, being raised incorruptible, this is something that was taught from the Old Testament to the New. Right? And it's going to happen to us one day. And when he says in Malachi 4, he says, to go forth and to grow up. 
That's talking about our bodies, but I think there's also a spiritual application there. I think those are, those are commands that we could operate by today. Now you're in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse number 35. But some men will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So what he's getting into the introduction here is, just as a seed, our body's going to have to die, and then one day we'll come back to life, right? Our spirit is what really matters, and that's like a picture of what's inside of a seed. Look, he says in verse 39, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Now, celestial is a picture of heaven. Terrestrial is terrain, which is the earth. Right? We have physical earthly bodies. We're on the ground. There are also celestial bodies. This is a picture of the heavenly. He says, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. What makes a celestial body or a heavenly body, a spirit, an angel, any of those things in that category, is what makes it unique in the glory of it is totally separate and different from what makes the human body unique in how God created it. Right? Our bodies are unique in how God created it. We're made in His image, right? in God's image, but yet we're all very different. Yep. So I, I can't just point at one man, oh, that's what God looks like. Wait, He looks like that too. He looks like that. Wait a minute, right? It's, it's our shape and our form, right? Now look what He says, moving on. He says in verse 41, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. He's saying even of the, the celestial bodies that we can see, the sun is totally different than the moon. And some of these stars that shine red are different, different from the ones in the blue, that are blue or whatever. What he's getting at here is we will also be different in the resurrection. Look what he says. Verse 42. For so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. Our bodies are corruptible. It says it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So our current bodies are, they are dishonored. They're weak. But one day we will have a glorious body. A body full of power. A body much like the Lord Jesus Christ after He rose from the dead. Look, it says in 44, It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So the last Adam, being a picture of Jesus Christ, came in the power of the Holy Spirit, came in the power of God, and was raised again. So He is that quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual. So even though we have spirits and souls inside of our body today, one day we will have a spiritual body. Our spirit and our soul is contained in an earthly vessel, the Bible says. It's like a, a clay pot that's holding on to our spirit. And one day we'll have a totally spiritual body. And that comes after this body. He says, The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is from the Lord, is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also shall bear the image of the heavenly. So one day we will have a spiritual body, a celestial body, a heavenly body. That will be our resurrected body is what he's teaching here. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
So again, the rapture, the resurrection of the saints, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, just, I love the message that we have in here because the thing that I really try to attach to, how he talks about how one star differeth in glory from another star. Listen, the things you do in this body will affect the type of body you have when you're resurrected. Right? In my Father's house, there are many mansions. Those mansions, I believe, that's our body. It's talking about we are built up as lively stones. One day, you will have a spiritual body. And when I look at your body, it's going to be different than my body. And it's going to be based on the things that you did while you were in the fleshly body. Based on, the, on, on how willing you were to give your time and your thoughts and your heart to the Lord. To serve the Lord. That's how God will ultimately reward us. Because He has many things in the future planned that we don't even understand. We couldn't even comprehend if you showed it to us. Like a dog looking at a, a combustible engine, it doesn't know what's going on, right? God doesn't tell us everything that's in His future other than, he, hey, we're going to be raised again. We're going to have a body. We will be rewarded for what we do now. Considering those things, we ought to make the Lord our priority. That's right. Look, He says in verse 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Listen, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory, through our Lord Jesus Christ. He just said, how do we become immortal? How do we overcome this corruptible flesh? This flesh that's just fallen apart, that's defiled, that's constantly in sin. How do we overcome it? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's yeah. how we get the victory. That's right. Look, it says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now turn back to Malachi 4. Because we're going to be raised incorruptible, because we'll have a body, because we'll have rewards of the Lord, therefore, we should stand fast. We should not move. We should abound in God's work. He ends with that verse after a whole chapter about the resurrection. Consider the meaning of, of just being steadfast. Yeah. Your Malachi chapter 4, look at verse number 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. So, you know, I like this go forth and grow up. I almost think that could be a good motto for the new year, right? Because, you know, if, if we're going to do this in the end times, what he's talking about here is us being resurrected and marching in God's army. Right? But if we're going to do that in the end times, at the end of the world, why not do it now? Yeah. Right? Why not go forth with the gospel in your mouth? Why not grow up with the Word of God in your heart? That's right. That ought to be our goal. Amen. Is to go forth and to grow up. Yeah. Go forth and preach. Grow up and read. Verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day of that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. You understand that we're in God's army, and even though He executes judgment and He consumes them with fire from His mouth and all that, He still uses us right. to walk all over them that have just mocked God and ridiculed Christianity. Right. In Revelation 19, He says, and He was clothed in a vesture dipped with blood, and His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed Him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and that he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is the Lord of lords, and we are in his army. He is ultimately victorious, but yet, hey, the kingdom of heaven will suffer violence. And our days we will see Christians being, I mean, who knows, put to death, yeah. hurt, yelled at, mocked, made fun of on Facebook to get a nasty fun. Is that really bad compared to what we've seen the early Christians go through? No. no it's, not. it's nothing compared to what's going to happen one day. And we ought to just be steadfast and say, I don't care 
if it's a, a dirty phone call, a, a mean letter, or if it's somebody threatening me with violence, I'm going to serve the Lord God. Amen. That's my priority. Look at verse number four. Hey, we will rule and reign with him. Yeah, we will. Verse number four, it says, remember, in Malachi, this just blows my mind, that this verse is kind of in the middle. He goes from the day of the Lord and the judgment, the resurrection, and then look what he says in verse four. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Right in the middle of this, the last chapter of the, of, of the Old Testament here, He's saying, don't forget my law. Don't forget what I told Moses. Let's take a look. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. It almost seems out of place, but yet I think it's as God puts everything there for a reason. When He's warning of the, of the coming day of the Lord and how he, he will consume the wicked and how He will judge and how we will be resurrected, and then He says, don't forget my law. Yeah. Just do not forget it. Look at Deuteronomy 4, verse number 1. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add to the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So here, as he, you know, it's in the next chapter, he reiterates the Ten Commandments, right? But he, he reminds them, he says, do not add to my word. And he says, don't diminish either. Diminish means to take away. And what's interesting is at the end of the Bible, the last chapter, he says, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You want a surefire way to go to hell and lose out on all the promises of God and all the blessings of God? Change the Bible, right? Westcott and Hort. Yep. Or defend the Bible being changed like, like James White or some of yeah. these guys that would say, Come well, on. you know, it, it, the Bible says such and such. Let me show you. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't mean that. That's not for us. Somebody with a wicked heart would intentionally change the Bible. Right. Yeah. I don't think it's possible for a born-again believer to intentionally change the Bible. If you misquote something, that's not going against God's Word. That's just you out of ignorance, right? Yeah. This is talking about people that become reprobate because of their hatred for God and His Word. Which is why he said, remember the law. Look at verse number 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. When I read this, I can't help but think, of, of the reputation of America in the past, right? We don't have this reputation anymore. America is hated around the world and rightfully so. We go around picking fights all around the world in the name of the United Nations and it is wicked as hell. I mean, we're working for the, the Antichrist nation of Jerusalem. Look, there's some, some bad things happening in America right now and there's a bunch of Christian in name only that are following after it, yeah. that are supporting it. You've seen the graven image of the little fish on the back of the car, right? I saw one the other day with the fish and a hexagram, the six-pointed star in it. I'm thinking, now how wicked is that? To say, oh, this Antichrist nation, I'll put that with the fish. We'll call it Jesus and the Antichrist Jews. What a contradiction. But that was America in the past. And judgment will come on this nation if we don't stand up and change things. It starts with us. Hey, it may come whether it may be too late. It may be God asking us to get up and warn so when it happens they know that it's of God. Amen. Look at verse number 10. It says, Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. He keeps talking about teaching your children. He keeps talking about educating the next generation. 
But you know, when it says that they may learn to fear me, remember we read in Malachi about those that fear my name, right? He wants us to learn to fear God. The law is that we know we're a sinner. That way we know that there's a punishment. The law is to cause us to fear God. And this is why there's a disconnect from the world. The world doesn't want you to preach, do bad and God will judge you, right? They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear the law of the Lord because they want to stay in their sin and they want to, they want to get away with things, they think, right? But it takes an honest person recognizing the law to say, you know what, I'm guilty before God. I'm guilty. He got me. I broke the law. I need to be humble. Lord, I'm sorry. Right? That takes an honest, humble person to fear God and hear His law and say, yep, you know, that thing you just read, that's me. That's me. And the world says, oh, well, you Christians that read the Bible, you're a bunch of self-righteous. You know, and hey, there's the self-righteous fake Christians. But as a true Christian, we have to be self-judging. We have to be self-judging. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If we would judge ourselves by the Word of God, that takes a humble heart, that takes an honest person, Lord, I'm guilty. Lord, I'm not perfect. Thank God you are. What can I do for you? That's the type of people we ought to be. Turn back to Malachi 4. Malachi chapter 4. Now these last two verses, we get into, we get into John the Baptist, and we touched on him a little bit in Malachi 3. Look at verse number 5 in Malachi 4. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now turn to Luke chapter 1. Now Jesus, when he spoke of John the Baptist, he said, And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. What he was saying was, John the Baptist was that promise that was to come of Elijah, okay? Luke chapter 1, where you're heading, look at verse number 6. This is talking about the parents of John the Baptist. Right now, remember how we're supposed to teach the children? Teach the children, look what it says. Well, look what type of parents John the Baptist had. Verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless, those are great parents, right? Hey, mom and dad, could that be said of you? Are you reserving something to say, oh, well, you know, I do, I do really well with these things, but I got this one thing. I'm just going to hide it from, from the kids. They'll never know. No, they'll know. They'll do it. They'll go beyond. We ought to be blameless before the Lord. Look at verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Look, did it say he would be great in the sight of men? No, he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. Yeah. There were many men that came and wandered. There were many men that came and mocked John the Baptist. Yeah. Of the sight of men, what would they say? Well, he was low. He, he was base. He was worthless. He was poor. He was uneducated. He was unimportant. But in God's eyes, he was great Amen. because he was a preacher of righteousness. Look at verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Now here's part of the promise that we just read in Malachi. And shall go, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So when in Malachi it talked about turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and from the children to the fathers, it's not just an authority structure. He defines it here in verse 17 when he says the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Hey, sometimes it takes a saved child to get the heart of the Father to turn to the Lord. Right? Even some of us in this church have experienced this where you come to salvation late in life and you say, you know what? Mom and Dad aren't saved. i got to get my parents saved now. Now that I know that I wasn't saved, I want to help them get it right. And he was going before in the power 
and the spirit and the power of Elias. So it wasn't the physical Elijah. It was that spirit of God that worked through Elijah. Look at verse 76 in this chapter. He says, To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That ought to be our goal. Look at verse 76. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto His people by the remission of their sins. Now turn to Matthew chapter 11. So remember to, you know, to go forth and to grow up is something we'll all do one day. How much more did that did John the Baptist while he was on the earth? He went forth, right? He grew in wisdom and stature. He grew in knowledge of the Bible. And he went forth and he preached it. And he gave knowledge of salvation. He gave knowledge that your sins have been forgiven through the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in Matthew chapter 11. Find verse number 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? So Jesus sort of asked the rhetorical question, like, when you went out into the wilderness, what did you go see? A, a reed shaking in the wind? Like, did you go see a scaredy cat? Right? Somebody just, you know, shaking in their boots a little bit? No, they went to see a powerful man of God yeah. preach the Word of God. That's right. A bold man. Look at verse 8. He says, but what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Yeah. Did you go see a, a that real smart rich guy that's real smart in business in this world? No, he's up in the castle. When they went to the wilderness, they were searching for the wisdom of the Lord. But what went ye out for to see? Verse 9. A prophet? Yea, and I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before me. So when it said he, he was preparing a people for the Lord, the people he said, I'm sending my messenger before your face. Don't miss him. Don't forget to listen to him. You better hearken to his voice. Look, he says in 11, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You think about what he's saying here. The people that are in heaven, even the lowest in heaven, are better than the best man on earth. Right? right? But John the Baptist, when he got to heaven, I'm sure he's elevated to a whole nother level. Right? But how great it is to be in heaven. Right? It's absent from the body, present from the Lord. Right? Hey, I'm willing to depart now. Lord, take me now. You know, you still got stuff to do, right? <laughs> you need to suffer a little more. I got things for you to do. Right? But John the Baptist was such a great man. Not because of his lifestyle, his diet. It's because of his desire to serve the Lord and preach the Word. Yes, sir. Listen, and I don't think God is calling for all of us to go and live a John the Baptist lifestyle. That was just part of him out in the wilderness bringing people to him. God was using that as a sign. But I believe that the willingness and the spirit and the power that John the Baptist had, I believe all of us in here can have that same power and that same spirit. Amen. You think about the man Elijah and his servant Elisha who asked the Lord for a double portion of the spirit. Right? Did he get it? Yes, he did. God wanted him to have it. Hey, I wanted to have it too, right? So how much more ought you to be asking the Lord? Well, you gave John the Baptist this great power and great spirit. Lord, I know I don't live like John the Baptist, but I want that power. And I want that spirit. Not to magnify myself, because even John the Baptist said that he must decrease. John the Baptist knew that he must pass away, even when it came to death. He said, I'm going to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach His Word at all cost. And if we would have that same heart, that same mentality, that same spirit, God would give us great power to see many people saved, just as John the Baptist did. But look at this last verse here. In verse 12, he says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. We will see Christianity attacked, mocked, ridiculed, hijacked, right? And then eventually fall away into Ju Judaism or Ju you know, Christian, you know, whatever, a, a blend of it or whatever, a world religion, ecumenical spirit, whatever it is. Christianity one day as a whole will probably just 
fade away and there'll be a small remnant left. Turn to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So here in Malachi 3, there's some, some key phrases. He says, I will send my messenger to prepare the way. There's several verses that confirm the prophecies of this throughout the New Testament. Matthew 11, verse 10, he says, For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Mark chapter 1, verse 2, he says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Luke chapter 7, verse 27, it says, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Turn to Mark, Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. So in three different places in the Gospels, in different accounts, you have Jesus confirming these things that, hey, yes, this was him. Yes, this is the fulfilled prophecy. Yeah. But yet, a lot of the people didn't understand it because of the way that Malachi is written and even Isaiah and Zechariah or Zephaniah, other, other places that would mention similar things, they say, well, when I see the day of the Lord, we see the Savior, but we also see the kingdom of the Lord set up, right? And they, had a, they didn't quite see the whole picture, and Jesus was coming in part, and obviously He has more to fulfill. In Isaiah 40, it says, the voice of Him that crieth in the wilderness. Right? That's what it said in Malachi 4. It says, prepare ye the way. That's what it said in Malachi 3. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So, there's a, Isaiah was a whole other prophet, a whole other promise of Elijah to come. And again, it's not Elijah, it's the spirit of Elijah through John the Baptist. In Matthew 3, verse 3, it confirms it. It says, This is he that was spoken of by the prophet Esaias, which is Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Mark 1, he says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. What's he saying when he says make his paths straight? Get your life right. Right? Here comes God. Prepare for the Lord. Get right. Get ready. Here he comes. Luke 3, he says, As it is written in the book of the words of Esaias the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. You're in Malachi 4. And the Lord works in ways like this where out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? There are several prophets that have foretold of this. There are several accounts in the New Testament that confirm it. And there are so many prophecies confirmed in the New Testament. I mean, that in itself could be a lifelong study. There are people that have lists of these things, but I mean, you yourself in your daily reading, you're, you're going to find gems. You're going to find things that you didn't know about. Oh, wow. Look at this. God promised to that, and here it is. In Malachi 4, Verse number 5, just to reiterate here. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now turn. To, we're done here. Look at Revelation 22. The last chapter in the Bible. I find it interesting in the last chapter of the Old Testament here where he talks about the coming of the, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And also, Elijah coming, in the, kind of in the same sentence here, right? And so why is it that the people, when Jesus showed up, the disciples and the Pharisees, they didn't understand. They saw part of a sign, but they didn't see the rest of it, I think. In Revelation 22, we sort of have a similar thing. Uh, remember in Acts, when the disciples had asked, they said, they asked him, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel, right? And he said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Why were the disciples who walked with Jesus and had all this wisdom and knowledge that came from the Lord, why were they asking, well, Lord, here you, we saw Elijah, then here you are, now set up the kingdom, right? Where's New Jerusalem? It's time to rule and reign. Let's get rid of these wicked people. That's what they were asking. 
but they couldn't perceive the time or the season because things are written mysteriously. Right. And yet when you look at the end of Revelation, I think we have a similar mystery. Right? Look at verse number 20. It says, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And it makes me think about a lot of the people that have fallen for the pre-trib. Yeah. Right? The pre-tribulation rapture. Right. Nothing bad's going to happen. He's going to come real quick. And it's like, well, why? Maybe because they only have half the picture. Right. Yeah. Maybe because now in retrospect, we can look back and say, boy, those disciples were so stupid in the book of Acts to ask that question. Lord, are you going to start setting up your kingdom? Is it time to rule and reign right now? They were idiots, right? But we see more than they saw because we have more scripture. Right. And yet there are things still yet to come, things yet to be fulfilled before the Lord comes, but yet he still says, I come quickly. Yeah, and I believe a big part of this message is in your day, in your walk, it ought to be, hey, this could be my last day. Right? right? But by the grace of God go I. Right? Yeah. I never know when my last day is. Right? right? You right. could you could fall off a ladder. I mean, you could get hit by a car. I mean, any of us could die just like that. Right. And it's not for us to know, but it could be quickly. So why not live every day as if what if this is my last chance to get somebody saved? Right. What if this is my last chance to earn a reward and please my Father, my Savior, in heaven. Go forth and grow up. Let's take a spiritual application of that. Go forth and preach the Gospel. Grow up. Read the Word of God. Get some knowledge in you. The Lord will bless it. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for the Word. Lord, thank You for this book in the Old Testament. Lord, it's amazing how many things we can learn out of the Old Testament when the rest of the world would say it's worthless and there's no application today. But Lord, we love every word and we want to learn every doctrine. And Lord, we trust you to provide the understanding and the knowledge. Lord, I pray that you would help our church as we move forward to a new year. I pray that you would bless our soul winning efforts. And Lord, we trust you to keep us safe. And, and Lord, please send more labors. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.